morning, everybody. Um, first, just to say thank you to, to Kirby and Vicky for, for having me. It's a tremendous event, and I'm honored to, to speak. Uh, right after me, my colleague from the School of Mines, uh, Professor Ian Lang, is going to give some comments, and he's uh, worth staying around for. So I I'm going to. Uh, you, you, you're all energy experts. You're working at local levels primarily. I'm going to uh, take us to the global level and touch on uh, some of the, the important things I think that are happening globally that in some way impact the work you're doing or ways you think about it. Um, so the, the typical way, you saw a lot of these graphs yesterday on the left there, typical way energy people talk about energy systems are in these various upward sloping fuels curves, right? And there it's just plotted against industrial development. So if, if, if you're like me and you go to a million energy conferences, that, that's the sort of opening slide you see. The, the point, though, about these slides are they don't actually tell you very much. They give you very generic numbers and they um, conflate all kinds of different things. They conflate different cultures, different markets, different pricing, different capital, um, different policies, different communities. And so what you get is this nice sort of picture. And the, the other thing they do is they don't give you a very accurate picture according to thermodynamics. And what I mean by that is that they're almost always done in what's called total final, uh, total primary energy not final consumption. So we can get into that a little bit. Um, and then here to the right, I've sort of roughed out that curve because the shape of it is always the same, roughly going up steeply, and mapped out that the future energy system is, is and is going to be more mineral dependent, almost for sure. Now, the, the, the last thing to say about things like this when they, these are historical, and then when people try to make forecasts, the technical term is that they're garbage. <laughs> so you don't, I was just, I was just on with, with journalists today about that. And, and, and so w w those of us who have been in the energy sector our whole careers, we're, 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 we're just terrible at the forecasting. Even in markets that are liquid and well-priced like oil, we're still bad at it. And so you have to keep that with you as you look at anything that goes beyond the past, right? So I'm going to come back. My, my name is Morgan Bazillion. I'm a professor at the Colorado School of Mines. I moved to the School of Mines about four years ago from the World Bank. And when I come to, I, I, I did a talk right when I was moving from the World Bank to mines in, um, in Marcellus country in, in Pennsylvania. And I said, so how many of you know what the World Bank does? And nobody raised their hand. And I said, how many of you know what the Colorado School of Mines is? And everybody raised their hand. So it, 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 it's been an interesting journey for me. For me. I'm not a uh, long time academic. This is my first role, role in the academy. I do have a the, the degree for it. Um, but I worked in the World Bank and before that in the United Nations and before that in government in Europe, mostly in Ireland, uh, where I understand the president was uh, in Ireland yesterday. Um, yeah. So um, he, here's those forecasts. Okay, so the forecasts are all in blue and gray, those, those curves there to the right. And then this is from the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, the sort of international group that does the science part about climate change. Th this is their future scenarios, net zero, whatever scenarios. And then onto that, I mapped fact. So I mapped history. So the history is in the red, and the, the, the future projections or forecasts are in the blue. So you can see the curve even if you're not mathematically inclined, which I think most of you are, uh, you can see the curve does something we've never done before. It's also really, really easy to draw a curve that goes like this. My 12-year-old son can draw that curve, 
and Ian can teach all of his students to make curves that go like this. You just have to put in different assumptions. And most of the assumptions that you put in are technical assumptions. What kind of fuels? Technical assumptions. And if you think about the world or even the energy system just in terms of fuels, you're missing almost everything. You wouldn't expect me to say that because you're working in oil and gas or you're working in electricity or something else. But it happens to be that if you don't take into consideration finance, capital, right, how you finance things, what the cost of capital is, what the policy environment is, what the risk tolerance is, what the bankers are telling you you can and cannot do, what the uh, community engagement is like, what the permitting is like, I imagine most of you spend a lot of time on those things more than worrying about just the fuels, right? So the energy discussion at the global level has been dominated by the war in Ukraine, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. However, what we were seeing before the invasion of Ukraine was very high commodity prices, and not just electricity in Europe, natural gas in Europe, steel, coal, before the invasion. So some people say, well, Putin is so smart he took advantage of that and that's how he destabilized it. I don't give him so much credit, but it, that, that is the case. So the war did not just cause these massive uprisings. It happened before. So markets were very stressed prior to that war, which is still going on. And I only put this up because uh, I was speaking to the American Banking Association, which has you know, $20 trillion under uh, asset management between the people in the room. And they said to me, well, what's the price of oil going to be? But people love to ask you the price of oil, right? And you say, well, I'm actually pretty good at this, and I have no idea what the price of oil is going to be. It used to be on Twitter. Every year on uh, January 1st, me and about 50 other guys who, or people who are all oil forecasters would put, place a bet in January for December on Brent, dated Brent on December 31st of the year. And this was full of the, the, the world's best oil analysts from all the big shops. And it was just, you know, the, the pick a number out of a hat and throw it up. No one got it right, even in oil. And this morning, so, so we saw the banking, this recent version of the banking crisis happen. Oil took a hit for all kinds of different reasons. And now it's back up. And so, you know, there's a million of these kind of uh, articles that just show this movement. And, and then with a quote by Goldman Sachs telling you it's going to go like this, it's going to go like this. And so today, they, the, the EPA, or yesterday, the EPA released a document about making many more electric vehicles on the market, you know, essentially by using the cafe, st the standards, right, for, for, for uh, light duty and, and thing. And so the journalist calls me today and she said, can I read you a piece of that, um, of that uh, legislation, and, or, or the, you know, the explanation of it. And it says, well, we had Woodmac. I assume there's probably some Woodmac people in here. Advan uh, apologies in advance. So we had Woodmac uh, come in and tell us that the price of lithium for the batteries of those EVs was going to stabilize pretty soon. They are pretty sure it's going to stabilize. And the language was that. Not even pretty sure. Very confident. Ten years down, that a market that has zero comparative liquidity price discovery is priced in, half of it's priced in yuan, but Woodmac is pretty confident we're going to have a stable, non-volatile lithium market in a few years when everything just settles down. And she said, do you have a comment on that? And I said, well, you can quote me either by calling them heroic or absurd, but you can choose. But both of those adjectives work for that kind of thing. So, and, what, and, and this is a good example of that. So last year, nickel is traded on the London Metals Exchange. Nickel's really important for batteries and all kinds of other stuff. The London Metals Exchange um, crashed 
for two weeks because of some Chinese short selling. So the market was offline for something like two weeks, yeah? Can you imagine the oil market, global oil market going offline for two weeks? It's like totally gone, no trading. What would happen to the global economy? That's what you're seeing with nickel, and nickel's one of the good ones of these minerals and metals. And then, <laughs> this I really like, they, they backed it up like a gold standard, like they wanted to show some actual nickel, and it was just a bag of rocks <laughs> with no nickel. So, um, <laughs> that's great. So I was just explaining, maybe I won't name out companies, that a certain company <laughs> um, was backing up their nickel with markets. The point about talking about these other markets that are coming on is that we're seeing huge demand for these things and the markets are not ready. If any of us wants to know the price of oil or any of our kids want to know the price of oil, you take out your phone and you can find it pretty accurately to two significant, a few significant digits in the North Sea, in Texas, and two other places in the United States and Dubai, like that. You cannot do that for lithium and be confident for it. You cannot do that with nickel and be confident about it. And what's happening in some of these markets is that there, we actually, no one actually wants the rocks. What you want is refined product, which is a chemical. And chemicals markets, as some of you know, are very different to typical commodities markets. So we have even another layer of complexity. We're, we're saying now, well, we're gonna just ramp this up but we have these really fragile or untransparent or poor price discovery markets, which is bad for an enormous amount of reasons. Imagine taking a project to your board or to a county, a government or in private sector, and the, and, and the project's gonna take 20 years and then has a life of another 20 years, and you have to get up and give that forecast for the price of your commodity and everybody in the room is laughing at you. It makes it very difficult to do anything in those markets for that, in, in those sectors for that reason. So I'm turning back to oil and natural gas, but I'm staying on the geopolitical front. Um, uh, some of you remember now almost a couple of years ago, there was a uh, deal, LNG deal, bet between Anji and Nextera, yeah, uh, no, yeah. Somebody? Yeah, in Texas, for LNG. Seven billion dollar contract. The French government said, no, we're not doing it. And the reason they gave, I understand the French translation was, that it's too dirty. So they canceled a seven billion dollar contract. That had much, much bigger waves on Wall Street than if Greenpeace rode up to the ship and stopped the ship, right? This was seven billion dollar real contract canceled. What does too dirty mean? Or what, what, what did too dirty mean? It was never defined. Too dirty is, I believe, some conflation, so some mixture of flaring, uh, venting, j other methane emissions, and politics. So it's not, you, you can't put that in a thermodynamic equation because then all of a sudden, and I wrote th both of these articles, one, one, about a year and a half later, what happened? We had a $7 billion deal, we had a $10 billion deal, we had another $10 billion deal, and there's as much, they're buying as much LNG at high prices in Europe as they possibly can get. What changed with those uh, Texan or Louisiana or New Mexican uh, molecules? Nothing changed. So, but there, there are now a lot of efforts, as you, as you know, by a lot of the big companies. We, we, we do some work with Chenier and others um, around methane emissions. We provide the world's global gas flaring. I'm gonna show you that. But the molecules themselves didn't change. The priorities changed. And that's what most of my talk is about, is about priorities. Priorities matter an enormous amount for policy and they're totally fleeting. So here's some of our natural gas work. I called out some of the companies, some of whom are in the room. We thank you very much. Um, we focus on data science for methane emissions. So this is what you see here. <laughs> Took a lot of PhDs who are really 
pleased with themselves to do this <laughs> very good, nice graph. But what you can see is if I have a leak there, you know, the, 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 the red triangle there is leaking something, uh, uh, methane. And then I have all these on the, very on the site, very close to it, I have all these sensors. Look at, you know, what do you think? Sensor one's going to pick it up. But then, okay, no, there's no more leak in sensor one, right? So we're coming up with algorithms, data science algorithms that try to deal with this. And so every day, from some of you in the room, we get hundreds of sites with SCADA data, wind direction, wind speed, VOCs, methane. And we have to turn all of that data, which is now called a big data problem. And when I was growing up, it was called statistics. Um, <laughs> mash it together and come out with something that regulators can use and investors can use and companies can use. Yeah? And everyone says, well, I, just give me the number. I, I just want the answer. And well, I'll tell you, it's complicated as hell. And so we're making, as usual, we're making up regulation as we go to the best of the ability, but this is a complicated data science problem. Not, not to mention all the other stuff you heard from CSU and DAM and the, the actual kit that goes in the field. Just the data science is complicated. Luckily at Mines, we have a lot of people who are extraordinarily good at math. Now, so I'm coming back to the war now. So, so now we're, we, we see priorities, right? So w the priority today in energy policy in the European Union and in Asia is security. So you could have said before the war there was a handful of countries in the world, say the United States and a few countries in Europe, where climate change was a pri an actual priority, right? It was actually listed as a priority. Today, how many countries in the world have climate change as a priority? Like maybe one, one of the I island nations. That's it. Everybody else is either on security, and oddly enough, the United States is not really on security. The United States is on political stuff like the price of gasoline. Th that, that was, at least, and still is, I think, the political priority in the United States in the energy sector. We have a massive war going on. We have a huge global energy crisis. Most of our trading partners are focused on security, not us. You could argue with me, but I'm right. <laughs> and this is, this is, I'm summing up Professor Lang's uh, detailed economics analysis. So this is what people like Ian and his students work really hard, and I used to, on analyzing data and analyzing four policies, trying to create good policy and regulations. And so you would put together all these models and you'd really, tr you know, do some fancy, nice optimization math if you could, do everything you could, guess about the future. And then the politician would be like, you know what, I like the number 20 for 2020. <laughs> Let's go with that. And what about for 2050? How about 50? <laughs> and, that, and, th and then that's exactly how 90% of more than 90% of policies are put in place. And the, the, the EV one from yesterday is no different. You come back and you might as well just burn it down because priorities and politics are in all policies, always. Anyone who tells you that you're, you're going to get some smart mathematician from the School of Mines to optimize and tell you what the policy are, haven't done policy before. Not how it works. It's politics and priority. So I'm switching gears a tiny bit and I'm looking at the rest of the world and you heard a little bit about developing countries uh, yesterday. When I was at the United Nations, I helped start something called Sustainable Energy for All, which is about getting quality, reliable, affordable energy services to poor countries. It's called sustainable energy for all. It's not called clean energy for all. It's not called dirty energy for all. It's called sustainable. And the sustainable there, the key was the affordability and then the reliability. But still to this day, when someone talks about energy access, like you, you, you've heard, you will hear the word, three billion people do not have access to um, 
liquid fuels or uh, non-solid fuels for cooking and heating, and that about one billion don't have access to electricity. Okay, so the data on both those numbers is not very good, so they're, they're sort of beautiful numbers. They come out with more significant digits than they should, but a lot of the work we've been doing is saying, well, hold on, you're saying only a billion people don't have access to electricity, but how many don't have access to, we called it uh, reasonable electricity, which by that we meant the lights actually stay on. <laughs> <laughs> and the frequency is okay, and you can run a business off of it, or you can actually rely on it, right? Cold beer, warm showers. And the answer to that question is it's closer to about three billion people don't have access to that, maybe higher. And so, but what you see, OECD countries, the wealthy countries in the world are in red circles there, roughly. And that means stable or declining energy demand over time, and the yellow are growing. So energy demand's kind of a wonky term that doesn't mean that much to people in their everyday lives. Um, but what it means is jobs, money, and infrastructure. So the jobs, money, and infrastructure are going into developing economies in the biggest amounts. And one of the biggest issues they have right now is the cost of capital. So you probably thought I was going to say whether or not they were going to use solar or gas or so something else. No. The issue is cost of capital. So they cannot, because of the risk perceptions and the real risk in most developing economies, let alone emerging economies, you have a huge cost of capital crisis. That, that is going to be one of their, that is today one of their biggest problems. So a couple of years ago, before the war, the German government asked me and two German academics to tell them what the energy system was going to look like in 2100. So we sighed, we said we have no idea, and then we did some scenario exercise and we mapped out what kind of big things might happen in the world, and here's a list of some of them, that we have a radically changing natural gas landscape, that's LNG. We have, well, LNG and American gas. We have growing and, and not clear cybersecurity threats, we have minerals, we have connecting grids, we have this huge issue of inequality, and it's not just about technology. It, there's a way to think about technology, such as it's called, it's called hardware, software, and orgware. It came out of this guy in, in Vienna, actually. And so we typically, at a lot of conferences, you start, you, you really talk about hardware, meaning the, the fuel, the stuff. But if you don't have the software and the orgware, orgware meaning organization, and you don't have the equivalent of the software, how to control it, markets, all that kind of stuff, you don't, you, like I said at the beginning, you're missing an awful lot. So we took those geopolitical contours and came up with these scenarios that I had my uh, five-year-old son draw. <laughs> so they're just about as accurate as anyone else forecasts. And we had four different ones we did. That's no, that, that was, uh, we went through this methodology. So we have four. One said, well, everything's going to go green. Everything's going to be green. By that, you know, renewables and, 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 and fossil fuels are going to fall off the end. And then we started going the other way. And one is called technology breakthrough. By the way, you can tell by my tone how likely you think the, I think the first one is. But we didn't put likelihood on it. But Technology breakthrough, that's where China and the United States go into a technology warfare and all the poor countries get left out and the two of our countries and China sort of develop all the, all the new tech. That's happening right now. Wh whether it'll continue in that way or not is not clear. Um, we have one called dirty nationalism. That's where you put up borders and more, less trade, more walls. It's really inefficient, but um, we see a lot of examples about it. And then we have one called muddling on. That, that's just, if you, if you do something in Europe, you have to do muddling on, which just means we sort of keep going, right? It often tends to be the most likely because there's so much inertia in the system. And we came up with three takeaways. 
that zero carbon future world does not do away with tension and geopolitical tension. There's just different tension. There's different winners and losers. And that the, the speed at which we change these things matters a great deal. Governments are terrible at navigating quick speed and you will likely create more tension if you go too fast. Now, some people would argue, well, if you go too slow, you have a problem too. Okay, but the too fast one is, is the one that's more disconcerting for, for geopolitics. By that, I mean the relationship between states, the relationship between countries, wars, or aggression, or non-state actors. And the last one was you shift attention from goals to pathways. What that means is it's very easy politically, as you all know, to stand up as a politician and tell me in 2050 you're gonna have net zero something, system. It's not very hard to do. It's very attractive politically. Most of those people are not gonna be alive in 2050 or they're gonna be long retired. And it's very easy to do. And I'll give you the exact empirical evidence for how easy that is to do. Is that at two years ago, right uh, uh, um, six weeks before they invaded Ukraine, uh, the Russians came to the climate talks, the annual climate talks, and said, hey, we're going to go net zero. 2060, I think they said. Who care? It's not worth the paper it's written on, right? It wasn't even written, probably. But, okay, that's the point there. If you, the hard work that you all are engaged in is detailed every day, getting stuff done, getting stuff built, getting the regulations written, and, and doing stuff. That's very difficult work. It's much easier for the politicians to say something else. So when we look around the world, it used to be the case that satellite imagery and data was the purview of the intelligence community and the military, military intelligence and civilian intelligence, at least in the United States. So those are the places you've heard of, like the NSA and DOD's intelligence agency, et cetera, right? Now, um, I have this on my phone every day, and at the Payne Institute, we have a world-class capability to do satellite monitoring. And what, how we do it is we see visible and infrared at night. So over the last 20 years, the scientists who came up with this, the most popular product is um, upper left. You can see the flaring in the Permian and the Bakken. We provide uh, most of the big energy companies globally with um, satellite data of the flaring, and it's pretty accurate. We, we have a lot of ways to, to do it, and what we do is we take the satellite imagery, which comes off of two NASA satellites that are in polar orbit, so they go around the world here, and the world moves like this. We see the whole world every day, twice, and we take basic laws of physics, and apply a Planck curve to those visible spectrum things, and then we, we, we impute heat. So we see light, and we calculate heat. So we can see the difference between uh, flaring and biomass burning, or forest fires. They, they have very different peaks, and they're different temperatures. The flaring is much hotter. So in the upper left, you see two of our products. One is called Nighttime Lights, which is pretty self-explanatory, the, the, and the other in the pink there in the upper left is um, the flaring. And then in the coast, in the gulf there, you see that white? That is fishing boats. So we have products for lights, fires, and boats. And we can see the boats, especially for some, some of the fishing, because it comes down in these metal hydride lights, and you can see it. We can see it either directly or we can see it bouncing off the, 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 the ocean. We produce this for the entire world every day. And um, so go, moving on the top there, the upper right, we saw the Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. All the lights go out when the U.S. abruptly pulled out of Afghanistan. Um, I worked, I helped lead the energy work at the World Bank in Afghanistan for many years, and so this, this abrupt uh, leaving was was difficult to watch, and, and then we saw it in, in real time. And then middle left, um, 
The lights go out all the time in Puerto Rico. Sometimes it makes the headlines, sometimes it doesn't. We see it all the time. Uh, moving over, I'm very mostly proud of this one, so that's middle right. Every day since the beginning of the war, the Payne Institute has delivered through the Air Force Academy to Ukrainian forces images of the kinetic activity, that means the bombs, and then their power system every day. And, and we still do that. Uh, I don't know who gets it exactly. Um, in the lower left, we calculated the amount of illegal oil production by ISIS, the Islamic State, Daesh, in Syria and Iraq when they were, had taken over parts of Syria and Iraq. Um, and then lower right is, is a power system map. So the different colors show the decreasing power, decreasing lights outside in Syria over the course of the war. So we do a lot of sort of security-based work with this. Um, I would say, at least for the students, but anyone else, if you're interested in getting involved with this kind of work, l l let me know. Um, the physicists are really good at the physics and not quite as good as how it uh, impacts on human beings. The math is excellent. So in 2008, I published a book with a very catchy title, Analytical Methods for Energy Diversity and Security. Huge seller. <laughs> I mean, at least four or five libraries bought it. It was very math heavy. And in the foreword of that book in 2008, so we wrote it in 2007, we said the European Union better diversify away from Russian natural gas. I still get no credit for that, but I'm taking credit for it. <laughs> and this idea of diversity for security, diversity all across is usually taken to say, hey, we need diversity of supply. We need different stuff from different places, right? But diversity also means a lot of other things. And just like in the policy realm, if you just think of importing fuels as your diversity, what does it lead you to? So in 1978, President Carter sent the fifth fleet of the US Navy to the Strait of Hormuz. Part of the fifth fleet of the US Navy is still there. Doing what? Guarding the Strait of Hormuz. Who produces more oil than Saudi? You do. The United States does. So why is the Fifth Fleet over there. The Fifth Fleet's a lot of money every day. There's a lot of kit and soldiers. That's what you come to if you just look at security from a supply perspective. You have to look at the security in terms of the, the, the demand, always left out of the conversation, absolutely fundamental. Europe finally got that, sort of six months into the war, and they're doing it. Demand is quick. You can do stuff with demand quickly. Organizations, you have to have a, a portfolio of different kinds of diverse organizations that have different powers and can do stuff, on and on. So if you just think of supply, you only come to one answer, which is usually put up the military somewhere. Um, in any case, it's still available, I understand, in case all of you want to purchase the book. Um, <laughs> So this is the way we define what's called criticality, which means security, in the United States for, for critical minerals. Uh, you guys have heard of this critical mineral stuff, yeah? It's become quite popular. It's become prioritized, and I'm going to come back to that. Right? It's politically prioritized, and therefore you hear about it. And therefore stuff gets done on it. Without that priority, that doesn't happen. So we define criticality. It's a lovely little algorithm done by the USGS, but it's a supply algorithm. Where do we get that stuff and how dependent are we for it? Yeah? And that's just showing you that it, it used to be 35 and now we have 50 of these things, 50 critical minerals. Just as an aside, if you're doing something on security, you never want to go more. You always want to go less because you can only focus on, a, you can only prioritize a certain amount of things. So instead of going from 35 to 50, we should have gone from 35 to 20. And we'd have a hell of a lot better chance of actually doing something about 20 than we do about 50. There's 50 different markets, 50 different types of stakeholders, 50 different supply chains. They're not all the same thing. And it's all about the supply chain. 
and China knows this. So every day I get a phone call from a journalist, or every week, saying, hey, can't we just dominate China in critical minerals? That's the question. I heard we can. We're really good at stuff. Can't we just dominate China? Well, the answer is no. And the answer is no because China's been paying attention to this and prioritizing it for 25 years. Has gone all over the world and made huge investments in places we don't invest. Does not have any problem with social license to operate or permitting, right? And uh, has a trained workforce in this stuff. And doesn't have any environmental uh, re regulatory hurdles, so to speak of. They're not very tough ones. So you, they want this stuff, they put it up. Very hard to compete with that. In, I mean, you, you guys deal with this every day, right? Imagine competing with that. You don't have to quite as much in oil and gas, but in minerals we do. And they're winning by a long shot. Um, yeah, we'll do some stuff that helps, but uh, it's going to take a while. They're way ahead. And here's their dominance across these things. And, and here's, here's why I love the confidence, I'm not going to say it, of the certain consulting company. Here's the, here's the, here's the lithium curve, price curve, over the last number of years. Yeah, I <laughs> no one predicts that kind of curve. It's almost impossible for a mathematical model to predict that kind of curve. Um, so I'm going to stop here and we can go into to some questions. Um, priorities matter a great deal and they change rapidly. They're ephemeral. They go up and down. So do I think critical minerals is going to be the priority for a long time? No, I don't. There's a lot of other priorities people have. Is climate change a priority for most countries? We said no. And is it a priority for most people at the local level? No. So the far more powerful driver of these things it, for voters and for people is something like air pollution or water pollution or noise. Right? Th those are the ones you want to watch out for when you're talking about the communities, not climate as much. Those are what people vote with. And that's really important. It sounds kind of subtle and maybe wrong. It's not. But um, keep that in mind. Priorities are everything for this stuff. Um, these are not just technical systems. They engage with humanity, with society. And in places outside of the United States, that's even more important for people who are struggling. And w the people in the rest of the world, w I, always get a I always ask the students, what does uh, someone the same age as one of these students want in uh, Nairobi? And the students hem and haw. Hmm, what do they want? The answer is they want the same thing you want. They want fast internet cold coffee or warm coffee. They want to see their friends. They want to go see music. They want the exact same things you want. It's not a mystery. And we see the same thing when we, when we go and in the United Nations, they try to help these. It's mostly women who die from the indoor air pollution that you heard about. Mostly women and children because they're in there cooking. It's also a really important social part of social life. And so you go into these villages and you say, hey, we got a really cool, efficient stove. It's like this big. And you can just put it there and do all your cooking. And they look at you, thank you very much, and then they kick you out of their house. And because what do they want? They want a gas stove. They don't want, they, they don't want that thing, right? They want the gas stove. So these people all want the same things we want. And that's a huge market. That's five, six, seven billion, six billion people. Um, we've seen highly regulated markets in the past that are, that, that are moving even more to government intervention. You saw in Europe, there was massive margin calls that were covered by governments. Billions of dollars of margin calls on gas and electricity covered by governments. You're now in the UK. You, you saw what was one of the most well-developed power markets in the world lovely locational, marginal pricing, the whole thing, 
and then the prime minister just came in and said, hey, uh, the max amount is X for everybody now. And all the academics, poor Ian, cried. The government's in your markets now in a big way. And it's, it's either security or pricing, depending on where you are. Um, it's the first time in a long time that clean energy prices, so let's say solar prices or batteries, have risen. So they were on really dramatic price declines for decades. And now it's, we're seeing a little bit of a rise for the first time in a long time. It's not all of it, but inflation and cost of capital is, is doing a lot of that. And then some of it is the input minerals to these things. Um, supply chains are not homogenous. So when we're talking about different supply chains, you have to think about different contours. And so th think about, it. You, a lot of you work in oil and gas. Even in electricity, it's a very different business. It operates on very different time frames. It has very different limitations geographically, right? And has very different risk perceptions and investment portfolios, yeah? So it's, it's very different even between those two. So if you start to smear things or you hear somebody telling you this can work for everything and does one of these, then don't listen to them. Um, we really have to do things like work, uh, work on governance for these markets, keep working on the governance in these markets. You know, most people say now, a, a lot of Americans say now, uh, you know, we, we, told the, we told the Germans not to deal with Russia. Look how naive they were. It's not a fair criticism. Yes, it turns out they were wrong, but the whole theory of how states engage, how countries engage with each other in terms of international relations has an assumption that you have rational actors to deal with. You have people who have some rationality. P you would say, there's no way he's gonna cut off the gas. It's, it's like half of GDP. No way. Guess what? Right? So now, when we think about China and Taiwan and other things, you'd say, well, y y y you're not going to separate out China from the international market. They're a rational actor. They, pro they provide everything we have in this room. But now that rational actor model is a little bit dinged. And so you're going to see different kinds of policies as a, as a result of it. Nothing changes a global paradigm in a matter of weeks. So all this, all this discussion about um, you know, immediately going to X goal or another on clean or, 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 or climate or, or even other ways, nothing changes that quickly. There, there's no real evidence that it's going to change that quickly. But be wary that people say, well, it's a, a, a clean electricity only makes up a tiny piece of the of the, the chunk, right? You hear that a lot, only makes up a tiny piece. Guess what? Exponential numbers will creep up on you very, very quickly. Go write down on a piece of math to some exponential, simple one, exponential uh, graph, right, curve. Look how fast it go, will catch up on you. Don't discount things that are exponential and don't always rely on what's called to total primary energy. It's not what we actually use. Yeah, that, there's a difference there. Um, I'm gonna stop by saying again, thank you very much to uh, Kirby and the team here and to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you. All right, question time. Raise your hand so we can get a sense of who would like to ask questions and we'll get to you. I won't make it fun of any more companies. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Can I just, I see people, is that okay, Kirby? Go, go ahead, Matt. Yep. Good afternoon, thank you, Morgan. I uh, thought it was terrific. Um, I don't wanna argue with you about yeah. security. Um, Take some you're probably right, the way out. but I, drink, yeah. I'll provoke you just a little bit. Um, it, it does seem that at least the phrase energy security 
you know, in the last couple of years, given Ukraine and so forth, is, is at least in the newspaper and on pages. And, you know, there's House Bill 1, I think, you know, wants to highlight that. So would you just respond to that a little bit and say, is, is it just fleeting? Is it not very real? Is it, you know, going to get swamped by something else? Thanks, Matt. No, so security is a very high priority. It, it, I think it will always be a high priority in the United States and fundamentally a higher priority than climate change or environmental issues. I'm making the point that the U.S. is not in the same space as the rest of the world in what is a global energy crisis, and we tend to be both insulated from it and ignorant of it. And so what we're seeing in Europe is energy security is top of their first thing on their list, while America still has the flexibility or ability to put it second or third with the political pricing of gasoline still first. You can frame that in a lot of different ways too. But the point I think, if, if you don't mind, Matt, is that security is the correct framing and a good goal. What, you, what, what the political rhetoric likes better is independence. And that leads to bad policy, even though it's politically attractive, where security can lead to good policy. So we, we hear the usual suspects on the blow up of Nordstrom 1 and 2, right? Some people say Russia, some people say US, some people say S Norway, Sweden, Ukraine. What's your opinion? <laughs> That's great. With the NSA listening, you can ask me that. Um, I think that the most recent research showing that it was um, independents that were tied to Ukrainian forces uh, seems the most uh, reasonable to me of those <laughs> theories. The rest are very politically driven, and that one has a little less of the politics in it, and so that's the one I'm buying for now. But I have no physical evidence to support that. All right, if no one else, I will ask one more. Um, I was at a different conference not so very long ago, and some very smart people opined that the transition, you know, some percentage, some year, is technically feasible, economically practicable, you know, a few other things, doable, 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 but building it out, the process, is the non-starter. You can't permit it fast enough. You can't do infrastructure fast enough. So, you know, how do we get there? Can we get there? What do we change? Yeah, so I uh, uh, ostensibly buy into that same. So look, it, it's, you get the first one out of the way. It's always technically feasible. It's definitely technically feasible. We can do it. So if you're gonna go after another technology for, not, for being variable or use some other word for it, it usually doesn't play that well. Um, because technically it's feasible, period. Now economically, there's a lot of range for that to be right or wrong. Um, as you know, Matt, those um, renewable technologies have high upfront costs and then no fuel costs. So the cost of cap they're very cost of capital sensitive, extremely cost of capital sensitive. So if you're in a low cost of capital environment, they do great. If you're in a high cost of capital environment, they're in trouble. So that's why I said it's not the technology. The technologies are excellent. And actually China makes really good photovoltaic panels, solar panels. So that one um, has a lot of things that maybe Ian will get into, but you know, that, that, that could go wrong with it. But I do ascribe to the fact that at least in the United States and in much of Europe, so almost all of Europe and Japan, um, building stuff is very, very difficult, right? So we all know that. I spent five years of my life trying to get an untreated gas plant built in, in Western Ireland it's like as long from here to that door. You know, Ireland's a tiny place. It was nothing. 
it took 10 years and hunger strikes and bombs in the streets, like just impossible to get, no one lived there. And then we tried to do the same thing with a high voltage cable, DC cable from the Republic to the north. Again, it's like, I don't even know, two kilometers or something. You would have seen the amount of pregnant women we had protesting because of the, uh, their perception of the magnetism. I'll tell you what, if you're in government, and you're trying to get a policy done and you have a thousand pregnant women against you, there's no way in hell you're going to win. <laughs> so the, the, the engagement with society, the engagement with communities, and the permitting reform, which should have already been done as part with IRA, desperately needs to be done, because if not, it's not serious. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.